Okay, so I'm gonna be roughing out these 10 screws in this video. And I don't normally do back processes, but the idea is that it will, doing them all at once will allow me to articulate things to you guys as different things crop up with different spoons that might not show up if I were to do them one at a time and only choose one of them to, uh, to do it. So this is also, this is for the online course that I offer. I'm doing this as well. And so I'm articulating these things for them. And, uh, and so that's why I'm going to be describing it throughout instead of just carving. So the first thing I always do is I make myself carve around the bowl. I used to not be so disciplined about that <clears throat> and I found that I was uh, saving the bowl for last because it was less fun and then I would over carve the neck because it was more fun and then I'd run into problems when I went to try and do the, do the bowl as well. So. Again, I'm roughing out all of these. So this stage for me is all about just sort of roughly getting it down to the line. I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm just trying to reduce the size. It's not about trying to get the finished shape at this stage. It's trying to reduce the size of the whole thing so that you can get a cleaner shape with the next round of cuts. So all I'm trying to do is have it meet certain sort of delicacy standards, I guess. If you guys have any questions as I go along, please feel free to shout them out. Um, like I said, all I'm doing in this video is I'm going to try and rough out 10 spoons in a row. And hopefully stuff will emerge as I do 10 in a row. Similar to how stuff emerges when I axe a bunch of stuff in a row. Um, that maybe wouldn't emerge otherwise. So, here's an interesting example of a a scoop that on the surface doesn't look like it has much crank, but because I left this thickness here, I can really uh, exaggerate the crank within that thickness by building in the movement in the back here. There we go. I'm also not going to stop and talk much because the goal really is I'm trying to carve 10 spoons today, which is more than I've ever tried to carve. I think the most I've ever done is eight. I think I'll be able to do it though because most of them are fairly small. I think I only have two that are on the large side here. Um, so what I consider roughing out is, uh, so I'm going to be moving fast. What I consider roughing out is just, <laughs> yeah, I do. Hey, Greg. Um, so what I consider roughing out is getting it to the stage where it's ready to, boy, phone call. Let me see who it is. I have no idea who that is. It's a robocall. So, um, so the main thing I'm trying to do with this is to get it to a stage where it's ready to be, have the shape redrawn on it. And then that will be a separate video. So I'm just going to be squaring up the handle, hogging out the back just to make sure I've got the right amount of material left. And I'm shooting for roughly five minutes per spoon to do this stage. In part because I want to see if I can do batch processes and have that increase my productivity. In the past, it has not. In the past, I've found that it actually does not increase my productivity to have uh, to try and do it this way. But as with everything, it's worth revisiting your preconceived notions. Good, so that's now ready. Those, oh, I should have a separate bag. That'd be really smart. Yeah, separate bag. Morning, Jerry. All right, so all the finished blanks now go 
And I'm just like that. Good. Next one, I guess I'll do, I have two large spoons. I guess I'll do those now. So these are all spoons that I'm carving to bring with me to the Spoonosaurus gathering at Matt's house to sell to people who are there. Um, I'm doing mostly eaters of various types, a couple cookers, some scoops, some pocket spoons, and then one long scoop and one cooking spatula. And we'll see if they sell. You never know. But I think they will. So again, when I do this stage of roughing out, it's all about getting the handle, I'm sorry, getting the bowl carved around the bowl. And I always do the outline first, because if you do anything other than the outline first, you're gonna obliterate the line that you just drew. So by carving to that line, even just roughly, you make it so that you can obliterate it without losing the advantage that you gained in having it in the first place. So um, notice how I'm using the tip of my knife and really, here, I'm going to try and uh, tilt this down so you guys can see a little bit better. I'm using the tip of my knife to really twist in these curves here. And also notice I'm not trying to get that perfect. I'm just trying to get it roughed out. Perfect will happen later. But if you spend a lot of time trying to get perfect at the roughed out stage, it turns out it just doesn't really matter. You're going to be removing so much more material later on that you've just wasted that time trying to get something perfect that you're going to recarve anyways. Now someone like Tom Scandian would say by getting it perfect, you then increase your chances of not having any problems arise later on. And to some extent he's right, but you can also anticipate what problems might arise <clears throat> and sort of make sure that all those boxes are checked as you go forward. And that's what I do. So it doesn't have to be perfect for me to know that it's going to work out. I just have to see that there aren't, you know, cracks in the certain places where I need there to not be cracks. I need to make sure that I've gotten, you know, twists out, all that. But Perfect doesn't need to happen at this stage. So often I um, will use the draw knife to dress up these longer forms. I'm not sure why I didn't. Uh, Ed, this is just an experiment today to see if it's any faster to do it this way. Plus I also thought it would help me make more useful videos for my online course to have them be able to see the iteration of doing the same thing over and over again in a given video. So the plan is to do a bunch of live sessions today where I sort of walk through the different stages, but instead of the usual videos where you walk through the stages all in one go, I'll have a series of videos at the end of today which show, if I don't run out of, of uh, juice to save them, which show sort of you know each stage separately. We'll see if it can upload to YouTube fast enough that I can delete them. All right, good. Again, I'm just roughing stuff out, so it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be good enough for this stage. And good enough is usually, for me, defined at this stage as getting under any ax marks and potential problems and reducing the weight of stuff such that it will be possible to do a really nice refined cut later on. Good. Okay. That's the next one done. And into the bag it goes. Notice that I'm keeping these bagged up. That is super important when you're doing this kind of back work. Because if you don't keep them bagged up, next one is a camping spoon. If you don't keep them bagged up, you're going to lose that precious moisture. Um, and I have gone to great lengths to get exactly the right amount of moisture in this wood, right? It's aged, so it has uh, not too much moisture, not, but certainly not as much as if it were totally fresh. But now that it has the right moisture content, I want to preserve that and keep that from disappearing. Okay. 
So one interesting thing about doing batch work that's already occurring to me is that <clears throat> this hogging out stage, which is the hardest part on your body because it really uses a lot of muscle power, will all be done early in the morning when I'm fresh. And then as I get closer to the end of the day, I should be doing smaller and smaller cuts. Now in the past, when I've tried doing batch work like this, what I've found is that I'm so tired by the end of the day that my hands get shaky. Um, but I'm curious to see if now that my, I have more strength from just doing this longer, um, if that will still be the case. Because if my hands aren't shaky, then it might work out great to have done it this way. So who knows? That's why I'm revisiting this, is that you never, you'll never want to just rest on your laurels. Use a spoon meal or shave horse with a draw knife. I do, Jerry, uh, with um, longer forms. So actually, if I had been thinking about it, I would have done so with this yesterday, except that I was right up against the wire and had to go inside and make dinner when I was doing these, and I just didn't do it. But yes, a draw knife certainly makes this part of the process easier, although there's, uh, there's a price to be paid, which is that you can end up sort of uh, losing some options because the draw knife closes some doors in terms of what it can do. Um, so it all depends. Um, but yeah, with longer forms, when I'm carving them, I tend to use the draw knife just to do the handle, do this essentially this step of roughing out the handle um, and the back of the bowl. I don't usually do the bowl rim or anything like that. Um, but um, and in the past, what I found with doing batched work like this was that it wasn't actually faster because I had to keep sort of reacquainting myself with a spoon. And I would also, um, you know, there's, just, there's so much to be said for sort of getting in the zone with a spoon and just going and going and going with it. And I didn't like the feeling of sort of jumping around from spoon to spoon, and how that made me lose that headspace. Um, that being said, because I'm trying to do a very ambitious number of spoons for me today, I'm trying to carve 10 spoons, I thought this might be a good <clears throat> a video of that process soon. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. It has not occurred to me to do a video of that process because I think because I don't consider it essential and I, and I, I have shied away from making a video that would imply to people that they need to buy something like a spoon mule or make something like a spoon mule in order to carve spoons. Um, but sure, why not? That's funny that it literally hasn't even occurred to me to do that um, because I consider it so non-essential a part of the process. What I found was that the spoon mule did, does nothing for me in terms of saving me time. All it does is takes about the same amount of time and reduces some of the fatigue on my body from doing a lot of uh, a lot of that kind of work over the course of a day. So if I'm carving a bunch of big things during the course of a day, I find that using the spoon meal is helpful. But other than that, I have not. <clears throat> and I don't use it on smaller things either. Just things with long handles. And you can see why, right? These cuts are powerful cuts. <clears throat> what kind of mule do I use? Yeah, I have uh, an early prototype that Dawson sold to me to do some testing on. Um, and since then, he's replaced the head because um, it got thrown off my porch by the tornado that came through. Um, all right, on to the next one. An eater this time. Uh, hole in a chopping block and a bench dog, by the way, to use a draw knife. Yep, and that's true. That's true. Um, that's a good idea. You should, you should prototype that. Yeah, there's many, many good ways of, of doing it. Um, I think the argument that's generally made for the spoon mule is that it is quick. Um, you know, 
the bench dog would simply be slow. And so it certainly wouldn't save you time because the time you'd save using the draw knife is fairly minimal. Um, and it's, it's only because with the spoon mule, it's, it's really fast to reposition the piece, um, that it makes sense, at least to me, to do it. So, yeah. Uh, interesting. I might have to stop and strop partway through this. On the other hand, I've just done one, two, three. This will be number four. And we're about 20 minutes in. So it appears that I'm doing roughly about one every five or six minutes, which is about what I'm shooting for. Um, so that's good. It certainly is a fast pace. It reminds me of the pace that I had to take when I was carving, went through a stint of trying to carve spoons really quickly. Um, yeah, see you later. Right. Notice how I'm not working truly sideways. My, my wrist is still straight and up like this. That's important. It also helps you keep your elbow in. Um, okay. So you can see I pretty much always do them in the same order of do the outline by doing the bowl first and then do the handle then do the handle end and then do the top usually starting with the handle but sometimes starting with the rim of the bowl if something's going on um, and then addressing the bottom of the spoon um, and I do that order of operations kind of no matter what the shape of the spoon is and the only thing that makes me change it is if there's something that might be problematic, I'll usually do it first just in case I run into an issue with it. And you can see when I do the back, I usually do that center line first and then I pull the rim up on either side. And I may or may not blend in between the two here. It's not really crucial at this stage to get that blend right, it's more crucial to get the rim nice and thin so that you can get a good outline at the next step once I've redrawn the shape. Okay. Good. Good. Also notice that at this stage, while I'm pulling the handle down closer to finished thickness, I'm not trying to get it all the way there. Again, it's about bringing the thickness of the thing into its final size slowly in stages. Okay, there's the next one. <clears throat> What's next? It's like a little mystery grab bag. Looks like another eater. So, you know, one of the other interesting things about carving like this is if I was doing one at a time, the sort of natural built-in pauses in which I'm not trying to do this heavy roughing in, if I'm doing one at a time, I would have already been on to much easier work at this point. So I'm really throwing a lot at my body, trying to rough out these 10 right in a row and as quickly as I'm trying to do them, which is just something to keep in mind that, you know, unless you're going to drive yourself like I'm driving myself here to be fast, you're not necessarily going to save any time. And if you are driving yourself like I am to be fast, you're certainly expending a lot of energy to do so. And it might be less energy to do them one at a time.
We'll see though. Maybe I'll carve these 10 spoons in half a day and I'll be super impressed with batch processes and do that for a bunch of stuff from here on out. I'm, I'm open to that happening. Uh, I'm just not sure if it's going to happen or not. You can see why I choose this curved end on the back here is that it's just really simple to make that happen. Okay. Good. All right, this one is definitely going to need a simpler handle than the, the type I normally do because the grain is so weird. We're going to do a simple sway back handle. And we're going to do a strong bump down right here to deal with the weirdness of the grain and the bowl rim. Okay. And this one, it's interesting how different pieces have dramatically different moisture contents. This one is much moister, but it doesn't have that kind of like sour smell that they do when, when there's when they've done a lot of fermenting. Okay, good. Bit of chippy grain right here. See how that pans out. Yeah. Do I find that pushing myself increases my strength, similar to the gym? Yes, but just like with the gym, it's possible to injure yourself. So, um, yeah, I have taken years, Philip, to build up to the level of being able to carve all day, day after day. Um, and even when I do it, if I don't have, you know, a break day on Sundays or a day or two during the week when I'm teaching, for instance, and therefore taking it relatively easy, I, I start to feel it because it's very physical work. Um, and it's tough on your hands, right? I mean, I don't know if you follow Matt White at all, but he just posted about how he's been carving every, every evening for the last couple of days, trying to build up some stuff to sell at the Spoonosaurus gathering and that, his hands hurt. And this is a guy who uses his hands to make knives for a living. But it's just a different type of hand strength that you use to carve. And it's uh, it's it's muscles that you wouldn't otherwise be using. So it's not like you could build it up in other ways. Um, although I have found that carving throughout the year has made me much less prone to injury during the Christmas tree season when I'm tying reeds because they are very similar hand motions. Okay, next one. Done. How many do I have? Done. That was number five. Just five? Okay. Let's get this pace cracking. Okay, another eater. This one's quite lopsided, so we'll try and address that at this stage. Get it up to snuff. Also much drier than the last one. It's interesting how, and these are from basically the same piece of wood, just different sections of it. You know, one was closer to the heart, one was further out. So super interesting to me how much variation that can be. Yeah, this handle's all twisted. Luckily, I left it thick. I think that's probably why I left it thick. I'll try and pull that in. Rah. Good. I'm going to stop and strop after this one because I think it's going to help. All right. Put this guy down.
Again, you can see these pivot cuts on the rim. These are the weirdest cuts to learn how to do. And my advice would be to just uh, sort of try and follow along, not even trying to do it necessarily, but just like following along as I'm doing them to try and figure out exactly what it is that I'm doing. There are other places where I break it down more, but this video might be a good place for you to practice doing them again and again as you watch me do them. Okay, good. I've been able to take out a lot of that twist and a lot of that misalignment without losing the size that I want. And it's paying attention to those kinds of things, like is there a twist and misalignment that you need to adjust now? If you adjust it sooner, you end up losing less, uh, less material because you can make sort of smaller changes that have the desired effect. Whereas if you wait till later, you might end up with a much smaller spoon than you intended. Six of ten. Oops. So far, it's been just shy of half an hour, and I've done six. So that's one every five minutes. Doing my math right here. So that's good. That's a pace that I would like to see. So, so far, each of these spoons has had about 10 minutes in it with five minutes to make the blank, five minutes to write out. Let's see. Typically, each of these spoons would take me about an hour to make without doing the batch process. And I'm curious to see what the average is if I do it this way. This kangaroo leather has a really nice drag. It's got a bit of silicone, uh, silicon rather, in it. You can feel it pulling on the metal. Good. Next spoon, ooh, pocket spoon. You can see how misaligned it is because there's some wiggle in the grain and I decided I wasn't gonna try and address it with the ax, but rather with the knife. Ooh, that's much nicer. Stropping, man, I tell you, stropping really helps. If your sharpening game is, if you have your sharpening figured out, stropping will take it to the next level. If you don't have your sharp, sharpening figured out, stropping isn't going to help you. But it will definitely help you if you know what you're doing with sharpening and are doing the right things. <clears throat> Let's see here. Good. Now again, this roughing out process, you can see that I'm in some extent, I'm going past the lines that I drew, and that's because the lines that I drew were just sort of rough guidelines to what needed to happen. And these drawings, again, are sort of, again, just rough guidelines to what needs to happen. Uh, there's nothing sacred about them. I'm just trying to sort of take them and then figure out what needs to happen to make the spoon even better using them as the starting point. All right, good. These spoons are tricky because without a, a shoulder to hold on to, there's, there's sort of much less to hold on to here in this phase.
these wide surfaces on the pocket spoons are tricky. Very tricky. Because they're so wide. Ah, they require a very sharp knife and a fair amount of force. Which, of course, has to be applied safely if it's to be of any use. There we go. Top face on that. So bear in mind, part of the reason why I'm pushing this hard is because I'm a production carver. There's absolutely no reason to push yourself this hard if you're just carving for the pleasure of it at home. Um, and so if it's not a business for you, be safe rather than, you know, pushing yourself to be as fast as possible because until you really have something locked down, being fast is where you're going to end up hurting yourself. Okay, another one done. Whew. So, in theory, maybe I'd left. One, two, three left. Okay, another pocket spoon. With pocket spoons, you can see I like to do this orientation with the bark up, uh, just because with that wide face on the pocket spoon, first of all, it allows me to do a really thin part here, um, but that wide face is just really beautiful. And it allows me to really showcase that, particularly if it's got these sort of two colorations like this one does. Um, There's nothing wrong with doing these spoons in the other orientation either. It's just that these spoons work out better than regular eating spoons do in this orientation. So if I have a scrap of wood and I have the ability to do this spoon rather than an eating spoon, depending on what somebody asked for, I'll, I'll, I'll do this kind of spoon because it just works out nicely. Okay. If you asked a question and I didn't see it because I didn't look up in time, please feel free to write it again. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I just, I'm also trying to move fast here. So that ax mark is what I'm trying to get under because I, I don't trust it. I want to make sure it's gone. There we go. Good. Whoa, funny smell just came off of this one. I must have hit some sort of pocket of scent or something. Yeah, that just smells like cherry. Initially, the initial scent wasn't cherry, though. It smelled more like skunk, and then it turned to cherry. It's weird. Okay.
10. Notice how on these wide faces, I'm sort of treating them by doing wide facets rather than trying to carve right across that wide face. I'll do a facet on the side that kind of locks in the rim at the thickness I want it. And then once that's reduced the weight in the middle, then I'll do the middle. Because trying to carve all the way across something that wide is just ridiculous. There's no reason to try and do that. It's way harder than it needs to be. Okay, good. That's number eight. Okay, and now I have two scoops. Scoops, especially these sort of small, deep scoops, even though they're small, they, uh, they present enough challenges that they usually take about the same amount of time as a large cooking spoon. And it has a lot to do with the amount of end grain that you're trying to cut across here. Um, but everything about them is just treated basically the same. Yeah. And now to make these indentations, I don't try and get them perfect at this stage. I just want to sort of roughly allude to where they start and stop and that will allow me to adjust them later on but there's no point in trying to make them too perfect at this stage because they're such a delicate feature that you never know exactly where they should be lined up and it's possible to overdo it and be make them too delicate by the time you get to the end of the process End of the handle. Good. Now we do the handle itself. Hi, Dano. Dano, you're going to Matt's on tomorrow, Friday, right? I'm going to see you there. I think Matt told me that. So you can see how this really just sort of alludes to where they are. It doesn't actually define them. Okay, good. Awesome, man. I look forward to it. So on the back of a scoop, I do even less. What I want to try and do is get under these ax marks and make sure they don't go too deep. And make sure that all this sort of area that got split rather than cut doesn't go too deep. I just don't want to be surprised later on in the process. That's all. And again, it's about making that rim thin. Whew, that end grain is hard to cut.
Okay, good. And last one. Wow, did a great time. So I'll be curious to see by the end of the day if I actually enjoy working at this level. This pace is not that different from how I'd be working if I was just carving one at a time. But it does feel somehow a little more, not frantic, but sort of hard. But I suspect that that's probably because at this stage, all I've been doing is the really hard roughing out. I wonder if as I get to the more delicate stages, the more refined stages, if it will actually be quite fun to sort of get to do all of that in a row. We'll find out. Okay, good. You can see that my scoops have quite a bit of crank because when you get down into something, you wanna be able to get it level real fast. See here. Okay. Yeah. Fierce cut to make. Okay. Good. So you can see my process is roughly the same no matter if I'm doing you know, a big cooker like I was doing at the beginning or a small scoop. It's always carve the outline, then carve the top face, then pull up the bottom to meet it and concentrate particularly on getting underneath any ax marks so that you're not surprised by how deep they go and getting the rim thin enough that at the next step, I can carve around it with a nice smooth cut without any surprises. So here I am doing the rim. And I also wanna take out any twists, etc. And to some extent do some realignment, although the next step is really where I'm gonna deal with alignment. Not so much twists. Twists, it's good to get out at this stage. spoon blanks roughed out in 45 minutes. I'm going to go eat some breakfast and then I will draw outlines and do another live session. I'm planning to do live sessions all day guys so um, as I work these spoons through to being done.